Last time we talked about the five different types of elders. We also talked about the five people who were elders in the church of Antioch. We looked at the different types of, uh, of both the different types of the offices in the church, the elders and the deacons. Uh, we saw that a, ch a, a, a biblical church, a New Testamentical church, has those types, the elders and the deacons. And I think that is important for us that we will have the same in our churches today. I would like to talk to you about the, sh the pastor and we will go to a, a number of things. We have three parts mentioned here, that is shepherd, member and evangelist. But before that, I would like to talk to you about the role of Jesus in, in, in a pastoral sense. So, let's, let's look at how Jesus looked him or thought of himself as, as a pastor. Uh, he is specifically mentioned as such in the book of First Peter. But so many people, when they speak about pastors, everyone has his own idea about what a pastor is doing, should be doing, and what he's actually doing. So what does a pastor do? So I had a, a conversation with someone and he said, well, a pastor is someone who goes from one member to another member, having a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, had had some cookies uh, when the, 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 the cup is empty he goes to the next member and he goes and talks to that person hoping that they will come to church on Sunday morning uh, and I looked at him and I said well, do you really think that's the role of a pastor and he said yes 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 because our pastor is doing that well, that's fine <laughs> uh, but I don't think that is the role of a pastor Someone else said to me, oh, the pastor is the one who takes care of the preaching in church. Oh, and I looked at him and I said, so you don't have a preacher, you have a pastor, a pastor preaching. And he said, yes, yes, that's what we have. So that's what he has to do. Well, of course, we have this, this biblical role in Ephesians 4. It speaks about the pastor and the teacher. So, well, kind of is, is good. Uh, another one said to me, oh, a pastor is a caregiver. Let me look at it. A care a giver. Yeah, yeah. Someone who takes care of the sheep, of the flock. And yeah, well, that's nice. Um, someone else came to me and he said, the pastor is the one who performs the rites of passage. And I looked at him and I was kind of, because that is not biblical, that is not theological uh, wording. And he said, yes, like baptism, uh, weddings, funerals. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah the, pass, the, the, the rites of passage. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Another one said to me, a pastor is the one who takes care of the administration. And... <clears throat> What do you mean by administration? Well, I, I, a pastor is someone who... Yeah, what, what, what is he really doing? I mean, you see, you're taking down, writing down that someone is in church or not in church, or uh, someone pays his, his, uh, his, his money and give, give money in the, uh, in the collection plate, or... No, I mean, that's not what a pastor is doing. But that's the idea many people have. He's the teacher, pastor. He's the caregiver, he's the performer of uh, pass, uh, rites of passage, or is the administrator. Someone came up with the idea, well, no, 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 no. He is the ambassador of the church in society. Hmm, that sounds good. But all five of them are right. <laughs> all five of them are right in, in the sense that that is the... Let me see, the most uh, traditional way of looking at the pastor. That's what the pastor should be doing, all those five. Until mm, the 70s of the 80s of last century, someone came up with the idea, uh, a pastor is the one who 
the, the, the bearer of the vision. And the vision it should be uh, handing out to, his, to the people under him. Under him? Yeah, the people under him. He, sh he should give the vision and he should lead them towards that vision. Okay, so what is he? What is he actually doing? Well, th the best way to describe him is like a CEO. A CEO. You mean a chief executive officer? Yeah, that's right. Is that what a pastor is? Yeah, yeah, he's the leader of the church and he takes those people with him and he's leading them. And oh, so if that is what a pastor is doing, why does he even have those, those bigger churches, the mega churches, have several pastors? Oh, well, there's always a lead pastor. Okay, fine. So when he is doing this and he's leading and the, and the other members of the church so he becomes the CEO of a church not anymore the pastor but the CEO that's well if you think that's right then it's then it's right for you but I don't think that's that's biblical uh, neither do I think that the first five were biblical and I don't think this this idea of the CEO uh, that he will be the leader and, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the vision bearer uh, he has to do uh, even the evangelism and, and so on. And he has to look for growth. But that's not what he is doing. He's actually uh, delegating it to other people. And the other people are doing that. Okay, so we have all five different different ways of looking at or or two different types of looking at since the, the, the 70s of last century. It, it sounds, uh, certainly the last part sounds more like a business practice. Oh, someone is good in business, so he must be in building a church. Huh? I, I don't think that's the biblical, uh, the biblical way. The, the only one I know comes close to that is actually Judas. Uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, that's the yeah, because he killed himself. So is that, is that the end for all the pastors killing themselves and that's the, the elevation? I don't think so. So, first of all, of course, a pastor is leading. But when, you, when you're part of a church and you follow or you come to that church on Sunday mornings and, and Bible studies during the week and, and having other ministries, because he is the one with the charisma and is attracting you, with his personality. Is that a biblical way? I don't think so. So. Uh, the other. The other critique. On, on this, this idea. Is that. You put too much emphasis. On the local church. When you have a mega church. With a, a mega pastor. Uh, yeah. He may be good in filling a building, and he may be good in building a building, but whether he's a good pastor, I don't know. I mean, that's not what I see. That's, what, that's not what I see in the Bible. So the role of a pastor should be based on a biblical model. What is the biblical model we have? So please forget all the, the things I said up till now, and now we start. Okay, let's look at Jesus. Because who else do we go to uh, to, to have a good idea what a pastor should look like or what the pastor should be doing. So I found five different issues. Uh, one is, Jesus builds relationships. So he's not so much into uh, in, in, in building people into something they, they are or they don't are or uh, giving them gifts which they don't use. That's a problem in church, a big problem in church. So first of all, he is the one, he's the one who builds a relationship. The first relationship he's building is with his father. So he builds fa the relationship with his father and then with the people around him. The second thing Jesus is doing, 
um, he's not preaching an emotional gospel. He's not preaching a uh, a please follow me gospel. He is is preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Okay. Third thing, what Jesus is doing, he meets the need of the people. When they are sick, he heals them. When they have when they have need, when they are hungry, he feeds them. When they need help with their relationship, he does that. The number four thing he's doing is making disciples. When Jesus makes disciples, and you can find that in the book of Matthew, what he is doing. Matthew and the discipleship. It should be a, a good it could be a good title for for a thesis. So if someone is looking to write a thesis, please come to me or contact me and we will talk about what he is doing. Because that is what Jesus is doing. Let me see. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. That is Matthew 9 verse 35. To all the towns and the villages. Teaching in their synagogues. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds. He had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples. The harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. And if that was true at the time. Even with hundreds of thousands of pastors. And people being paid to be a pastor. It's still true today. Because we have so many people. They have no clue why they go to church. Some of them do it because it's a, well, it's a tradition. Some it's a cultural thing. Some they have to do because they quote quote work for a Christian. And so they have to go to that church because that's where the boss is. And you want to have a race or you want to have promotion. You have to be close to the boss. But that is absolutely not what we are talking about here. We are talking about Jesus. Jesus is asking his people to do certain things. And they are listed in Matthew 10, the verses 7 and 8. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. And then he says, freely you have received, freely give. So it's not something you have to pay for. But how can Jesus ask this? Well, very simple. When you go and read the chapters 5 to 9, you find exactly that what Jesus is asking in chapter 10. He's actually showing his disciples. So you can almost say, he takes them by the hand and shows them what he is doing. And then he is asking them to do the same thing. And that is discipleship. That is leading in a, in a very positive way, helping while you are leading at the same time training your people the one the disciples of your own to show them what to do how to do it when to do it and that is what's happening here that is what Jesus is doing so I think that is what, uh, what when we about Jesus we see Jesus doing this so let's let's go over those five points again and uh, elaborate on it. First, the relationship with his father. You can, you can read your New Testament. And when you read it, especially in the Gospels, you will find how Jesus is functioning as a son on earth, but still having contact with his father. And you can, you can say all the time, because it's not just that he is... Uh, He's not faithful on the Wednesday evening Bible studies. And on the Sunday morning or Saturday morning, because they were Jewish, on the Sunday morning synagogue meetings, well, yeah, Jesus was there too. But every day, all day, he was there. 
he was functioning as in a son father relationship he is asking permission to the father to do certain things why is he doing that I mean he is God yes he is God but he deliberately chose to become like people and when you are like people you are like people so you are under the leadership of the father so he is in that in that way so the first thing he does and you can see that for example uh, he goes to the mountain to pray um, let me ask you how many times have you gone to the mountain to pray well <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I don't know uh, what is do we have do we have mountains here I mean in my country where I am right now the highest elevation we have is 600 something meters uh, funnily enough people talk about the mountains but 600 meters is not really a mountain but that's not the issue of course because Jesus was actually separating himself to a place where he could be alone alone with his father and you can go in the Bible you can find in Luke 6 verse 12 um, and he did that not only once but because in, in Matthew 14 we see a similar story Matthew 14 verse 23 Jesus is separating himself from other people even from his disciples to go and pray in Mark 1 verse 35 and so again you have it in the several in the in the synoptic gospels it's clearly that there is a a, a system in place Jesus is using and he had a, a very specific prayer life in in one land in one specific country I heard of of, of that type of prayer that is in Korea they have what they call mountain of prayer and so you can go there the mountain is big enough and you can even go there with thousands of people and still being all by yourself so that's outside of Seoul you go there and you can uh, be apart and be separated at the same time praying to your father and praying to the uh, for the people that are in in the towns and even on the mission field in the churches having their problems and we will look at we will look at some problems later on that is what Jesus was doing also so that's what he did and remember what Jesus did you probably have to do yourself whether it's on the mountain or in the closet and I found it very funny because closet in in the United States means something else than the closet Jesus was mentioning but I heard a story about the person that was literally going according to the Bible so she she locked herself up in the closet so the clothes were hanging there and she was sitting there uh, she opened the, the, the doors a little bit so she could have light to read and there she prayed I, I think that's funny in, in a sense that's not what Jesus was mentioning or what's me, the, 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 the meaning Jesus was putting into it but that's the idea to be separated from the world to be separated from the other people what Jesus did we can do and it's not that you do what you do you do better I think uh, that's only for Jesus to say that he what he did he did better why does I mean why is Jesus even actually praying well he needs to know the exact way the exact will of the father he needs to link up to the father's will to do the thing that the father has installed for him if Jesus has to do this who are we well, we have to do exactly the same thing how actually when you think about it what do you pray what is your prayer life your prayer life first is your prayer life the first thing you have to do is searching the will of God what is God's will in this in what I'm doing in what I'm thinking in what I'm hoping what I'm planning what the future holds installed for me and, and for my family 
So the first thing you have to do is find out what is the will of God. And Jesus consecrated himself to prayer. He went, even in the evening, to a separate place. Or in the morning, uh, he came back. And where did he come from? Well, you can see it in, uh, in the Gospels again and again. That he is, from a separate place, he comes to his disciples again. As Jesus needed to put his life in the hands of the Father, we have to do exactly the same. So, as pastor, he showed his disciples or his followers or his, his pupils what to do and how to do it. So he led a prayer life. And he said, you have to do the same thing. And I must say, I'm kind of amazed when you... Uh, when you hear or when you read the story of Gethsemane, because when they start praying, their eyes were heavy and they were actually falling asleep. And the only one who was freely praying was Jesus himself. And so he had to come back, wake them up again, and go back and then again. And the third time he said, you know, let me say it this way. Uh, he probably thought those men are hopeless. Anyway, I think in, in many cases it's the same for us. I, I remember um, I remember a talk between a, a Bible school director and there was a coming and so they, they sat down and had a cup of coffee together and the first the first thing the director asked was not what type of a degree do you have the first thing he asked was how many time do you spend in prayer every day and I was like <sighs> what a question but it's absolutely necessary to take time. Not just as, a, as a, a teacher in a Bible college or a Bible school, but as an individual believer to take time as Jesus did. When Jesus went to the temple, he had a different idea of the temple than the people. Because the people looked at the temple as a place for gatherings. And they looked at the temple as a place for, let's call it slaughter. I mean, they were offering, uh, sacrificing. But what was the idea of Jesus? Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. Not a house of sacrifices, not a house of slaughter, not a house of meetings, but a house of prayer. Have you ever thought of your church, your local place where you gather, as a place where you pray more than you sit down and listen to a sermon? Or sing hymns? Or have a ministry? A house of prayer. So, just bring, I bring this up and I, I would like you to think about it. Please do so. Think about the idea, the house of prayer. You know, when Jesus was talking about this, he was so angered that people were not doing exactly that. They were doing every, everything else except the prayer. Prayer is there not just to pray. Prayer means, literally, it only means asking. And that's why we have different types of praying. We talk about praise, we talk about worship. We talk about intercession, we talk about confession, all those things are prayer. But please, we are talking about the place where we can do that. And what do we do when we pray? You can pray for yourself, but you can also pray for someone else. And praying for someone else means you bring that person before the throne of God. And you ask God, the Father, to bless that person. 
or to bless the situation, to bless your church or your family or your friends or your business or your school or whatever. You bring it before the Lord and the Lord can bless it. But He can only bless it if you bring it before Him. If nobody brings it before Him, He cannot bless. He will still bless you because you are a child and you are His child. So that's what Jesus was doing. When He went unto the mountain and prayed, He prayed for His disciples. He prayed for the, for the 12 and for the 120 or the 70 or the people they met during the day and the people they are going to meet the next day. So he had that relationship. And that's the relationship we have to have also. So there is a prayerful relationship. The second thing Jesus did was he was preaching the gospel. How do you preach the gospel? Because you can read the Gospels, or you can read one Gospel. You can read it out loud, and then you become a, well, a Gospel reader. You can study it, and, you can, and then you know more of it. And that's all fine. But Jesus, he preached the Gospel. Well, he needed to preach the Gospel, because the Gospel was not written yet. So somebody had to take notes. In a literal in a literal sense, in the sense that he needed to take notes to, to know exactly what Jesus was talking about. So he brought those ideas together, and out of that, uh, that num a number of ideas were brought together, and that's where the first gospel was written. That's called the Gospel of Mark. And so he brought it in, and then Matthew built on it, and Luke built on it, and then later on, in 60 years later, or 30, 40 years later, uh, John was writing the gospel, and he uh, had extra information. He was the big friend of Jesus, but he was also there when Jesus preached the gospel. In Luke 4, the gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18, it says the following, Luke 4, and then Thomas did the same thing as I did Sunday, taking the wrong Bible book, but now I'm right. Luke 4, verse 18. And look at it. It says the following. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is how Jesus looked, in, looked at himself. He said, that is what I'm coming. That's why I came here. That's what I'm doing here. That is, proclaiming this. That's partly freedom. That's partly relief. And he speaks about himself as the anointed one, which is, Nothing less than the Messiah. Because anointed means Messiah, or Messiah means anointed. Or you can say Christ, it's the same word, it's just different languages. In uh, Matthew 9 verse 35, that's the, the verse we read already, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. And what did he do? He went there and had a good time. He went to the local McDonald's and had a, oh no, that's too early. There were no McDonald's at that time. So if no McDonald's, he had to do something else. So he went on the syn to the synagogues and he preached a gospel. He preached a sermon. You, you have to understand that the Jewish people know sermons. Even today they know sermons. And they are structured in a very specific way. Um, the, the freedom is not there to preach uh, about whatever you want to preach. Uh, that's uh, not Jewish. That's, that may be New Testamentical, but in the Jewish, name, the Jewish religion, you can't do that. You have to follow uh, uh, the order of the Bible reading. And the Bible reading is predicted by uh, the rabbis. So one of the rabbis will preach about one specific thing. In, in 
line with what is being read that week because they have the week readings. I, d- I don't know. I mean, maybe that's a good idea to study that uh, is to look at uh, they go through the Bible in one year or in two years or in five years. I don't know. I have to ask. Uh, maybe if I remember on, on Thursday, I can ask the rabbi. Okay, so Jesus preached the gospel. Uh, the Spirit was on him and he, he went from place to place. Jesus is not, one, he's not a pastor that stayed in a certain place and lived all his life in that place. No, he traveled around and preached the gospel in the different, in the different synagogues. And you, you, you may say, why did Jesus do that? Well, it's actually quite simple. In many synagogues, there was no rabbi. There were elders, but there was no rabbi. Because, well, not all the rabbis uh, were so friendly to go back to their hometown uh, after studying and then go back to their hometown and live in, in a life of poverty among the, the poor people. And then, no, many of them, they chose to go to Jerusalem where there were 400 synagogues. Uh, but Jesus was just doing the opposite. He went to the different places to meet the people, to meet the need of the people. Not only the physical need, but also the spiritual need. And that is what we call the gospel. The gospel means the good news. The good news Jesus was telling them. Uh, let's, let's look at some wording we have in the New Testament. Philippians 2, verse 16. God's word gives us life. God's word can make us righteous. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2. God's word can produce growth. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. God's word can sanctify us. John 17, verse 7. God's word can give us wisdom. Psalm 119, verse uh, 98. And, in, and of course, in the New Testament, in James 1. But just remember, it's not just about the, um, the, the issue itself. That, that the, it's not mere information. It is, it is how you deal with it, what you do with it, how do you live. When you know something, what do you do with it? And Paul is reminding us uh, about the new life we have in Christ. But how do we get new life? And what does it mean? And, and, and where does it come from? And, and of course, the better thing is to know where it goes to. So all those questions are mentioned and answered in the Bible. And when you want to know more, you just have to go through the New Testament. And of course, we have, we have this, uh, this wonderful thing. I don't know how it come, uh, or came about. I have no idea. But there is a list of 316 verses. And one of those 316 verses is chapter is, uh, um, uh, Timothy 2, or 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. And 2 Timothy 3.16 is, uh, I hope you know the text by, if you don't know it by heart, I hope you know, you know the, the contents of the of the the three sixteen. So let me read it to you. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Oh you mean that's only for the uh, uh, the theologians and the pastors and the deacons and the elders? No, that's not. The servant of God that means the deacon of God, or the, the in, in this case, actually, it literally speaks about the slave of God. So that is not just for the leadership, but that's for every individual believer. So three, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. 1 
think about it, not a theoretical, but a practical, a, a regenerational, a spiritual part of the underlying message that you find in all the Bible books. Okay. So, he preached the gospel. Maybe we can also say that he did not preach sociology. He did not preach psychology. He did not preach politicals or political sciences. But he preached. And look at this. He preached the word. What was the word of God when Jesus was on earth? That's the Old Testament. Of course, I mean, that's the only one that existed at that time. So, when they handed him a scroll, it was an Old Testament scroll. And he opened it, and he found the text, and then he brought that under the... Uh, in, in, he brought it into the light so the people could, could actually learn. And when, when, he, when he done those things, uh, people were saying, he's bringing it with authority. It's not just saying it, it's not just telling it, it's not just proclaiming it, but he's bringing it with authority. And the funny thing about authority, in Greek, in the New Testament, that's the word exousia. And exousia, that is, for us, in the first chapter of the book of John, you find the same word being mentioned. In verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. The word the right is the exousia. And you can translate it very easily in, in, in authority. And you can read it like that. There's, there's nothing wrong because that's the, the, the literal meaning of the word there. So he gave them the authority to become children of God. And that's what we are in, in the whole system that the, the, the New Testament is teaching us. So we are the children of God because we are given the right to do so. So the third thing he did, Jesus did was meeting the people. Um, remember we, we, we read about the sheep without the shepherd and I said that there are many churches even today today 1,000 well in this time I mean 1,500 pastors every month stop functioning as a pastor in the United States alone it means that 1,500 churches suddenly have no pastor. And that is the problem we face. And that's the problem Jesus looked at when he walked to uh, Israel at that time, preaching the gospel to different places. And you can have a, uh, a ministry like that in, in the United States. And uh, I met someone who has that ministry preaching in, in, in different churches every Sunday. And then I asked him, what, how do you make an income? How do you make a living? And he said, well, when I go to a Sunday morning service, they pay me a certain amount of money. When I go to an evening ser uh, service, they pay me a certain amount of money. When I go and I, I teach Bible classes, they pay me a certain amount of money. I do the Bible studies, the weekly Bible studies on Wednesday evening. They pay me a certain amount of money. I make more money by doing that than having a, a, a regular or secular job. And that's true. Because even the people in the churches, they are so uh, willing even to pay much money or a lot of money just to have someone to bring in, to teach them and let me say it like this, a little bit like, like shepherding them, guiding them along the path as to what Jesus was doing. 
So that is what he's doing. He's he's meeting the need of the people and that's what we have to do. The first thing Jesus did in, in every time he went in a village was mingling with the people. He did not... Um, he did not go on a, on, a, on a Saturday morning from one village to another running to the synagogue. That's not what he was doing. He was sending out a group of people before he came. And so the people in that village already knew a rabbi is coming. And so they gathered around and he mingled with them. Even healing people before and you know Jews you should not work on a, on a Sunday on a, on a Saturday on a Sabbath but Jesus actually worked on the Sabbath he performed miracles and you know they blamed him for, for performing miracles because you know Jesus said to the person who was healed said, take up your mat and walk the rabbis, uh, the priests, they were so angered by the fact that Jesus was going against the specific order of their idea of the Old Testament. But the first thing he did was taking care of the need of the people. So he, he before they would go to, uh, to the synagogue, and then he showed them it showed them some sympathy. It was not just, okay, here I am. Uh, you want to shake hands? You, wanna, you want to, uh, a, a selfie? Let's have, let's have a selfie. Well, or, uh, oh, can, can you give me a... No. Jesus was mingling with them to show sympathy, to be with them. He did not come to the earth to become elevated because the only elevation he did was hanging on the cross. So the first thing was mingling with the people. Second thing was showing sympathy. And thirdly, he, he gained their confidence. And when he gained their confidence, that's building a relationship. So what he did with his father first, he was also doing through the, the mingling or the meeting of the people's needs. And the third thing, we talked about it already, said something about it, that's making disciples. Everything he did, everything Jesus did was according to a plan to see that the people who were following him could understand what he was doing. And sometimes they asked him. And one day they asked him, why do you always speak in parables? And Jesus answered, took them apart, explained why. And then he even explained, in some cases, the parable itself. And then, those people who were blessed by Jesus took over later. And you see them again and again in the New Testament. Popping up. Doing exactly the same thing as what he did. When, when Peter was going around after uh, after Pentecost, he was traveling in different places and preaching the gospel as, Je- as he had seen Jesus doing it. He did not go on, on his own. I mean, he had a group of people. And one of those people was Mark. John Mark, actually. But he was, he, we, we know him as Mark. And he was, he was the one who was taking notes of what Peter was telling. And so he brought it into a gospel, which we call the Gospel of Mark. But remember, when Jesus was making disciples, one of the first things he said was, the harvest is plentiful. When you... uh, People who are uh, are trying to to, to make uh, make churches function in a proper way, especially in, in, in difficult areas, like the place we are living in, in Belgium, um, and there's a word that speaks about plentiful. It's like 
What exactly did Jesus mean by plentiful? What is plentiful? Because I can I think of plentiful as having a, uh, um, after 50 years of, of, of ministry, having a church of 5,000 people. That would be plentiful. But no, we don't have that. We don't even have 5,000 people all, all over the city of Antwerp. Because the plentiful is different here. In this case, we are happy to have a number of people. And the reason is that, again, the same thing as what we have, as what was at that time. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And even if you do your best and you try to, to evangelize and uh, build a church, it's not an easy thing. But that's the role Jesus took. That's the role, that's how Jesus brought his people. He took them with him and showed him what to do. Then afterwards he gave them the possibility of doing it. By the way, just to remember, when you go to the book of Matthew and you read the whole story of the disciples, you will see that, that that's exactly what Jesus did, as I just explained. But then the disciples went out and they came back to Jesus. And they said, you know, we cannot drive out demons. Of course you can drive out demons in the authority of Christ. But how do you drive out demons if you're not doing it according and in accordance with, for example, fasting and praying? So, in accordance with fasting and praying. So if you don't have those things done, how can you bring the gospel? There's a general rule in, in evangelism. And the rule is very simple. Never, hear me, hear me. Never talk to your neighbor about Christ. I will say that again so you understand what I'm saying. Never talk to your neighbor about Christ before talking to Christ about your neighbor. So prayer precedes the bringing of the gospel. If you don't pray, if you are not already mentally, spiritually ready to present the gospel, how would you present the gospel? What kind of gospel do you present? A gospel of weakness? A gospel of, I don't know what to do? You have a question? Yeah, please. Um, um, I, I don't know. And of course... And none of us is perfect and, and nobody knows everything. And so not knowing an answer to a question, uh, that's not a shame. I mean, you, you don't have to be ashamed of the fact that you don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. So if you don't know it, you can come back to that person and bring him the, the right answer. After looking it up, after praying about it. So we looked at Jesus and Jesus built up his relationship with his father. He built up, uh, he preached the gospel. He built up the leadership. You can almost say the servant leadership, the, the way he worked. And then the, the, the final thing that Jesus did was to sacrifice his life. He gave his life. Why? Because he had to do that? No, because that was a free will thing he did. He gave up his life. And that was done in a cruel way. Because the other people took advantage of him. And so they beat him. They didn't have to beat him. I mean, even if they just arrested him, put him in jail until he could crucify, they could crucify him, he would still have died at the cross. No, they took advantage. So he gave a sacrificial. And that's the same thing for the believers. If we do not believe in sacrificial giving, and I'm not, I'm not speaking about finances, but I'm meaning about a life, and about what you do and how you do it. If you don't do that this way, 
What are you doing? You may be looking like a Christian, but do the people know you as a Christian? I just read a story about a, a, a woman. Um, she was uh, in a conference, and someone, another woman, came to her and he said, I know you. And, and she looked at the woman and said, I, I know, I mean, you don't look familiar to me. So maybe you take me for someone else. Uh, and and uh, a little time later, they sat uh, around a table again. And she said, now I know who you are. Don't you have a white car? And she said, yeah, well, I used to have a white car. I saw you. I saw you on the traffic light. On the traffic light? Yeah, you, you, you lift up your hands and you were singing. And she said, yes, I, 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 I'm doing that almost every day. See, we live in the same village. I know you. And I was actually thinking of, I would like to have a, a Christian life like that person in the white car. And now I'm meeting you. And so they sat together, they prayed together, they wept together, and they had a relationship for life together. That is the difference between not doing something and doing something. Of course, not everything and not everyone can do the same thing. Uh, and if you don't have a white car, you can still reuse the, the red car or the, the, the gray car or the, blau, the blue car or the uh, whatever color car you have, you can still use it. It's not linked or, or limited to what you have. It's linked and limited to what you do. So that is what Jesus wants us to do, to take part of the whole. Just a little thing. Like the song says, that... You have a little light. Let your light shine in your little corner. And when everyone has a light and show that light to the world, we can light up the world.